So turn with me to Daniel chapter 5. And we are going to read verses 30 and 31 in chapter 5. We are going to roll right on through chapter 6 all the way to verse 28, all the way to the end. So Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, and then we are going to get down to chapter 6, verse 28. You realize that the chapter divisions were not there in the original uh, writing of this book, so uh, we are going to stick with the context and roll right on through. So if you would, please, I'm going to ask you to stand once again, get our calisthenics in. And we are going to stand in respect to God's word as I read these verses. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials of the, and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom." Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground or com for complaint against Daniel unless we find in connection with the law of his God. Then these officials and the satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions." Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that, it may, uh, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God, before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. And then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and he set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement and said to the king, and said to the king, King, know, O king, that this is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed." Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. 
Then at daybreak, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths that they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I, I have been done, I have, excuse me, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those who, men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the lion's den. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You can be seated. Isn't that a great story? Turbulent times. That is the setting of the story that we're looking at today. Now, I know it's, I mean, how many have heard this story before, right? In Sunday school, you heard it, and, and you got the flannel graph, and there's all these things, and I loved all that, and we, we learned it in Sunday school, and then we kind of forget it as adults, and there's, there's a deeper setting to this that I want to look at this morning. As adults, we can look at the political situation that Daniel was living under as uh, this, this new regime was coming into play in Babylon, and that is really the backdrop to this whole story, is that political climate that he was living in, and, and it played into everything that happened here. Now, I told you last week, if you remember, that I would explain to you who this Darius is. We came to that whole thing. The history, historical accounts talked about Cyrus all the way through, and Cyrus did this, and Cyrus conquered it, uh, conquered Babylon, and he did all this, and then all of a sudden this, this Darius pops into the scene, and it's like, who is this guy anyway? And I told you I'd tell you this week, right? Do you remember that? I mean, you wonder as you read it with all it said about Cyrus and the historical records we have around him, why didn't chapter 6, six start out and say, it pleased Cyrus to set over the kingdom 120 satraps? Well, here it is. You've been waiting all week. We don't really know who this Darius was. <laughs> so, you know, we have to get used to disappointment in life, right? We don't really know who he was. There's a, we don't have any historical records of him or who he was. There are lots written about him. I have read a lot over the past several weeks about just who this Darius may be. And there's this argument and that argument and this proof and that proof. But there are, honestly, no clear historical records of who this Darius was. Now, because of that, and this is why it's important, you might, well, then why did you even mention it, right? If, if we don't know who he is, why don't you just roll on with the story and we'll get to the flannel graph and we'll just keep going. I mention it because if you really look into this book, you look into the back book of Daniel, you're going to see that there are a number of people who have taken that fact that there is no clear historical record of this Darius, and they're going to say he's a fictional character and this isn't really even a true story. Now, because of that, other people stretch and strain to find some uh, way to substantiate this man, Darius the Mede, in order to substantiate the Bible. That's, that's our natural reaction, right? You're going to tell me, well, it's not true, and it's just a fictitious story, because we don't find any proof in history that this man lived. So I'm going to dig in history, and I'm going to find a way to substantiate the Bible as I believe it. And the truth is, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. It is true. 
just because we there are lots of people in the Bible that we don't have historical substantiation for that we, we we can be pretty sure we're there it is a true story it is not fiction this story happened and this is what I believe it happened exactly as it was said now here's what I think about this Darius I will give you something to chew over Darius the Mede was a great man of Median descent who was put in authority over Babylon by the coalition force of the Medes and the Persians to set things in order after Babylon fell. That's the story we had last week with Belshazzar. If you remember, Babylon was conquered by a coalition of the people, the armies from Media and the armies of Persia, and the two of them worked together to conquer Babylon. Now, history, of course, focuses on the single most memorable character involved in that operation, in taking it over, and that happens to be Cyrus, the Persian, because the Persians became the most prominent country in time. They eventually took over, and they became the most prominent ones, and we know that the ones who win are the ones who write history. Isn't that the way it goes? They win the battle, they write history. So we're much more aware of this Cyrus, and we're also aware of him because Cyrus was the one who gave the order to let the children of Israel, after the captivity, go back to Palestine. Not only did he send them back, but he paid for it. So this Cyrus is remembered very well in, in Jewish history. He is very well known, and that was all prophesied 100 years before he was ever born in the book of Isaiah. So Cyrus is important, but it doesn't mean he was the only one involved in it. Now this Darius, it says, looking back there at chapter 5, verse 31, where we started, and Darius the Mede, it says, Mede, it says received the kingdom. If you were to skip ahead to where we're going to be next week in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, uh, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Did you notice the verbs I'm emphasizing there? He didn't become king. He didn't seize the throne. He was made king. Someone else put him in power. It could, have, it could be referring to God putting him in power, which we know is the ultimate authority working in this. We saw that in chapter 1, where it was ultimately God who allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and, and take uh, Palestine. But um, it is also possible that the coalition force set this man Darius in place to put things in order. There's no reason to doubt that. He was obviously a Mede, and as I said, the Medes, uh, uh, the Persians became dominant, so that was remembered. But what you don't realize is that at the time that they took the city of Babylon, the Medes were the bigger army. The Medes were the bigger army, so it, it, it is totally, uh, perfectly plausible that the Medes put their man forward during these turbulent times, and the Persians put their man forward at, these, at this uh, critical time. Daniel took careful note to let us know that he was 62 years old when he took the role, which is never an accident when it's in Scripture, which is probably to help us understand that he was already old. No offense if you're over 62. That used to sound a lot older to me, but it's getting pretty close. But he was ready to start drawing Social Security, you know, and, and here he is. They're putting him in this position. What it's really there probably to tell us is they probably wasn't around all that long. They didn't live as long as we do today. They didn't have all the medicine that helped us, helps us now. Now, it's possible, too, that he and Cyrus were co-regents while Daniel uh, was there, because Daniel mentions the two of them together. In the last verse we read, it says, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Belshazzar, if you remember, was a co-regent of Babylon when his father, Nabonidus, was actually the king, and yet it called Belshazzar king. But Daniel never mentioned Nabonidus. You see, so there's no reason to worry about these things. Cyrus was clearly a Persian. Darius was clearly a Mede. The big point is we don't need to worry about it. Uh, he's not made up. This is not fiction. It is real, and it is history. I would remind you of a couple things here. 
Uh, it wasn't that long ago, as I mentioned last week, that critics were saying that chapter 5, the writing on the wall, was all uh, fiction because there were no historical records to substantiate any King Belshazzar in Babylon. Until there were, and all of a sudden there were records that substantiated that Belshazzar was there and he was reigning in Babylon as a co-regent with his father Nabonidus. It wasn't that long ago that people claimed that the Bible could not be true because it talked of this race of people called the Hittites who were the first to work with iron. And people would look at the Bible and say, it keeps talking about these Hittites and we know that they didn't exist. So the Bible can't be true. It has to be fiction. There's nothing to substantiate until there was. And then they found records around the early 1900s of this people that lived in Palestine called the Hittites who were the first workers in iron. I love the way the Bible is proved to be historically accurate over and over again. One of the commentators I read, I, I like the way he put it, he, he, he said it this way about Darius. He said, the historical identity of Darius has not yet been confirmed. Doesn't mean it's fiction. We just haven't found the exact confirmation yet. We could at any time. There's always excavations going on. People are finding things like about Belshazzar and the Hittites all the time. So we don't need to worry about that. You can trust the Word of God. Anyway, we see this, this man, Darius, setting up the coalition government after the fall of Babylon. And as I said, that is the backdrop for the whole story. He's there, he's in power, he's establishing this government. Darius divided the, the kingdom of Babylon into 120 districts he called satrapies. And he set a man over each one of these districts, kind of as a governor, to rule that 120th of the known world at that time, much like Nehemiah was set over Palestine, if you read the book of Nehemiah. He was there under the Persian government to, to run things. So these, these governors in these areas, the 120 of them, they were called satraps. And their purpose was to keep the kingdom from falling apart at the seams now that Babylon had fallen. Imagine the turmoil. The worldwide empire is gone. There is a new one being established. You've got to get controls in place to make sure everything doesn't fall apart. It's kind of like the Weimar Republic was put in place by the coalition armies, by the, the allies at the end of the war to end all wars. You remember which war that was? I heard somebody say it. World War I. Well, we kind of missed, didn't we? That one didn't quite end all wars. But... They put the uh, a Weimar Republic in place there. After we had defeated the Taliban in, in Afghanistan, we established a government there that was reinforced by the coalition of armies that came into the area. We see the same kind of thing going in here, and the same kind of turmoil was probably in place. So uh, Darius was working hard to establish this government and keep the peace throughout the, fo the former territory of Babylon. To keep these satraps under control, out in all these districts, and many of them far away, Darius set three men over them. They, he called them high officials. Now, if you remember, when he marched into the, the palace, I told you he came in, and they came into Babylon. They went through the river. They came up under the wall, these, these undefeatable walls, and they marched right into the palace, and there was no resistance. And I'm sure he saw something that made an impression on him, because it was the same night that Daniel had, had interpreted the writing on the wall for Belshazzar and told him, your kingdom's ending tonight. And like I told you last week, one thing that surprised me is that Belshazzar still gave him the purple robe and the gold chain and the proclamation that he was the next in line ruler under Belshazzar. Well, that is the scene that uh, Darius marches into, and he sees Daniel here being honored in such and such a way. He's got to find three people who can be these governors for him. He's heard the reputation of Daniel. We even saw how the queen mother had talked about Daniel. And he looks at him, and I think he says, well, there's one. I need two more. And so Daniel has a job. Seems like God always found a place for Daniel. He outlived an empire and was effective all that time. Well, there's one, I just need two more. 
If you remember, Daniel is like 80 years old. You might have been wondering, well, why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get those other jobs? You know, they were probably dead and gone by now. He was 80 years old. They had been in Babylon a long time. Who knows who Darius appointed for the other two, but needless to say, it didn't take Daniel long to take the top spot. In fact, as I was reading, you may have noticed it said, he was going to set Daniel over the whole kingdom. I like this guy. This guy's good. I'm going to let him just run everything, and everybody but me is going to be under this Daniel. Second only to Darius in the new government. An empire has fallen. A new one has risen. And think of this. This Jewish exile who came in as a prisoner is now in the top spot of the new government. It's, 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 it had to plague some of them to think this Jewish boy who was an outcast, who was a prisoner, is brought in. If you remember, that's even how Belshazzar spoke, to, spoke of him when he first met Daniel in the last chapter. He says, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles whom the king my father brought from Judah. That, that was, they were still thought of in that second class way, and here he is now uh, in, in, in line to be the first in the whole new kingdom. You know, one thing I think it shows, and it's one thing we can learn from as we look at living godly in a godless age and we see how Daniel lived, Daniel played the long game while he was living godly in a godless age. He wasn't a flash in the, in the pan. He played the long game. He outlasted an empire and he was still on top. You know, God tells us that when we're living in these times like this, that we're to live for the long game. Did you know that? Turn with me, in fact, to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, this is a set of verses that was written to the people of Israel just after the captivity, just after Daniel and his friends had been hauled away to this pagan culture and country called Babylon, after, just after the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed. Jan, Jeremiah, excuse me, I can't even say it. Jeremiah 29. I'm going to start at verse 4. We're going to go down through verse 14. I'm going to skip a couple verses in the middle just for length. Jeremiah 29, 4 says, Thus said the Lord, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have your sons and daughters take wives for, excuse me, take wives and have sons and daughters. There we go. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city that I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. See how he tells him there? You're going into exile. You know what I want you to do while you're there? Live keep on living. It kind of goes against where we were in the 70s. Remember, we always thought Jesus was coming tonight, coming tonight. And believe me, I hope he comes tonight. But I don't know that he will, and we have to live where we are. I love how he points out there, pray for the city you are in. This, this world you are in, you are settled in this world. You may not like what's going on, but what does he tell you to do about that area you're living in, that world you don't agree with? Pray for it. Yes. He continues, I'm going to skip down to verse 10. Some of these verses are going to be very familiar to you. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, he says, when I send you away for 70 years, it's going to expire. That's where we'll talk about that next week. I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I, you know this verse, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Did you realize that was tied to them being exiled to Babylon? Then you will call upon my name 
and uh, call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. You will seek me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. I am bringing you back, but this is what I want you to do while you are there. I want you to live, and I want you to prosper, and I want you to pray for the people around you that they will prosper too. I know Daniel had read this. We'll see the next week where he looks at this very passage. And I'm sure he was practicing it, living for the long game, because we see how he in his 80s is still living and going and prospering and leading the pagan nation he is in. And that's exactly how we should be living as we live godly in a godless age. But as I said, here's this young, young, young 80-year-old Jewish guy, this Jewish guy, this old 80-year-old Jewish guy, and he's about to come to the, almost to the throne, one notch below the throne himself. Let me ask you this, what do you think would be the reaction of all these governors and the satraps who see him being put in charge over them? <laughs> Jealous. Absolutely. Very jealous. That's, a, that's very true, Betty. They saw Daniel moving up in the ranks, and they were being left behind. They got jealous in this new political climate. You know, every, it's, it's, it's like political musical chairs, and everybody's trying to find their chairs, and the music's going to stop at any time. There's not enough chairs for everybody, and we see Daniel getting privileged to a certain chair here, and they're very jealous about that. This caused tremendous backlash against Daniel. Without him doing anything to them, we see no record of him doing anything. He did not campaign. He didn't do any of this. This was God moving him forward to influence this, this whole world, this whole nation for him. And as he's being put, back, put up that way, there is backlash against him. I have told you before that while we're trying to live godly in a godless age, we will not need to go looking for trouble. It will come looking for us if we just live the way God wants us to live in this world. There have been quite a few uh, crisis pregnancy centers that have been vandalized and some of them even torched. I think I heard up to 18 at some point on the news around our country since Roe versus Wade has been taken down, praise the Lord, since that has happened, these pregnancy, this crisis pregnancy centers that are trying to help women who are pregnant and help them through their time are being torched and vandalized by people who are angry over this decision. They haven't done anything to them. You're not seeing much of that on the news, I know, but it's going on. Let me tell you this story. Uh, when I was a baby in my parents' church, that church was burned to the ground by an arsonist quite a story. My brother's Bible actually survived. I don't know, have they found it yet? I know we were looking after dad passed, but... And, and what they had done to the area, they were just being a church. They were just there. They happened to be in a spot. And what happened is there was somebody who wanted to put up a new bar or nightclub or something like that, some drinking establishment. And the church happened to be located in an area which was too close to it. And so the zoning said they couldn't put the new club or bar there. So a man came into the church one night and piled up the hymnals in the back of the church and lit them and burned the church. Terrible thing is, you got to hire better criminals. He got the wrong church. <laughs> they weren't even in the zone he was worried about. There was another church in the zone, so I don't know if he ever got his permits or what. I hope he got a nice stay out there on Cooper Street in Jackson, you know, in that big facility there, but he burned the wrong church. Imagine how we would feel if we came in in the morning and we found that our church that we love had been burned to the ground. You're not looking for trouble. It will come looking for you. We should not be surprised when we see backlash whenever God's plans begin to move forward. Paul mentioned that when he was uh, still in Ephesus uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 8 and 9. Why don't you turn there with me? 
Keep your fingers moving. 1 Corinthians 16, 8, and 9, you're more familiar with the second half of this, but I'm reading the whole thing for context. And in verse 8, Paul writes and says, But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. I'm going to stay here for a while. Things are going well in Ephesus. But look what he says after that. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me. I've got a great opportunity. And what does he say right after it? There's much opposition, yes. There, there are many adversaries. Every time we think we're going to move forward with God, any time we see God moving forward in this world, there will be backlash. We do not have to go looking for uh, trouble. We don't need to be raising our hands. We don't need to be raising a stink. We live for God, and trouble will come to us. Not that we want it to. We just need to be ready for it. Daniel found himself with 122 adversaries, 120 satraps who were under him and two high-ranking officials who were his peers that he was about to be put over, and they were all plotting to get him ousted, and by ousted we can read dead, right? You ever feel like the whole world is out to get you? You're usually not right. Daniel was. Verse 4 says, Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find, ground, uh, find uh, ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. 122 of them were out to get him. And he was all alone. Here's the beauty. Verses 4 and 5. But they could, not, they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Isn't that beautiful? Five continues, Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. The only way we are going to trip this man up is if we can find his religion makes him do something that goes against our culture, and then we can do something. But as we look through his life, we can find nothing to accuse him of. If the world is trying to trip us up, can the same thing be said about us? That's hard. Are there any skeletons in our closets that can derail us from being useful to our God? How many politicians try to do something good? So many, uh, no matter what party they're with, they may go and they may want to do something good and do something great, and they start out with the best intentions, but then some deep, dark secret from their past comes and disrails, derails all their efforts. I've known of many people in the past that I would have wanted to vote for for president, and, and yet something comes out of the closet, and all of a sudden they're no longer a candidate. How many ministries and ministers are discredited in the eyes of the public by some foolish thing they did? Either in the past or they even get caught doing it at the time and their entire witness is ruined in the eyes of the people they are trying to reach for Christ. Happens all the time. And I'm sure Daniel was aware of the risk of that happening. It must have been if he was able to keep his testimony clean for 80 years. 80 years, and they could not find anything to accuse him of. All the temptations he was surrounded with, all the opportunities, all the way back to the first dinner he was served in chapter 1 when we started there, and he could have eaten it, this dinner that would have defiled his conscience and his relationship with God, he could have eaten it. Who would have said a thing? Who would have even thought a thing? Who would have ever known that he ate this? But no, he chose uh, not to eat it. I won't eat this because it's going to defile me. But he could have given in, and then one thing would lead to another, and one compromise on top of another, and he would have surrendered the opportunity to be the light to King Darius that God wanted him to be, and to King Nebuchadnezzar, and to everybody in between. So they looked at it and they said, the only way we can get him is to find some way his, he, his loyalty to his God uh, can be twisted and be made a bad thing. That's how they were going to get him. And they did. They came to King Darius and they said, O King Darius, live forever. 
all the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. I wonder if they just added some new uh, lions exhibit to the zoo as they moved in. I don't know. We never saw the lions mentioned before. It may just have been this was a really scary thing that you could keep people away from keep them in line with. But they said there's this den of lions and anybody who does anything, asks anything of anyone, any god or any man other than you, king, needs to go to the lions. Notice how they appealed to his need to establish a new government. King Darius lived forever. We are sure glad you're here now. That Belshazzar guy, king, it wasn't good. But you're here now, and we want your reign over us to be a long time. How about forever? Would you just stay here and be in charge of us forever, King Darius? Remember, the people didn't put up a fight when this army marched in. They're like, there's Belshazzar, have him. You know, we don't like him. We don't want him. Second thing they did, too, they said that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, King Darius, we want all decisions and all requests to go only through you for the next 30 days. That will establish your authority, won't it? Because we can't ask anything of anybody. Anybody in this whole worldwide empire that wants to ask anything has to get permission from you. You will be the most powerful man in the world. We will all come to you. And that includes the gods. How will that establish your kingdom? I notice as I read that too that they lied. Look at verse 7. How many of the officials and satraps did they say were with them? All. I heard somebody say it. All. Were they? There was one missing, wasn't there? They weren't all there. There was one person missing. And, and uh, so they they're all got a little loose at that point. Unfortunately, Darius forgot to count as well. His right-hand man wasn't standing there, and he didn't even wonder why. Because it was kind of stroking his ego. They were buttering him up. And it felt good, and it was going to help his cause. And when he heard all, he just went with it. But they lied. Can I tell you this? Satan is the master of little white lies. Maybe it was a rounding error or something like that. Satan is the master of little white lies, and he will use them in our world to try and prevent the plans of God from going forward. Did God really say you'll die if you eat that? Did God really say you couldn't eat of any of these trees? He'll come close to the truth and he'll just change it a little bit. And that is why our media is such a mess in the day and age we live in. I mean both sides, and there are two clear sides. And, and it seems the more I watch, uh, both sides are kind of uh, messing up on the facts. I heard a very good report uh, just about a week and a half ago, um, and a guy was talking, you know, he said, you know what the big problem is with all our news now is that there is no common set of facts. It's not like two people looking at the same set of facts and coming up with different conclusions. There's no common facts. Everything is different. And, and it's no wonder our world is such a mess. You should wear masks. You shouldn't wear masks. It's healthy to wear masks. It's not healthy to wear masks. And you're sitting here reading the paper going, you know? So I said, you do what works for you, <laughs> right? Now, the Medes and the Persians, uh, they brought something to this world that was new at the time. It was called rule of law. Here in the United States, we're the same kind of nation. We are a nation of laws. It's not that just people are in charge and telling what people what to do. We record laws and we live by them. That really came from the empire of the Medes and the Persians who had just taken power at this time. The king made the laws. Yes, he did. But once he did make the law, it was irrevocable. You can see that in the book of Esther. It'll play out there as well. But if they could get him to pass this law, since they were uh, ruled by the rule of law, that law would be etched in stone, and there would be no way out for Daniel. That's why they mention a couple times, it is the law of the, per, uh, the, the Medes and the Persians. And Darius fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. 
He signed the paper. All they had to do now was to wait for Daniel to do exactly what they knew he would do every single day, three times a day. He does this every day. We know he's going to do it. And all we got to do is wait. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, his home city, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. That is a key phrase. I, uh, King James says, as was his custom. It was his regular practice to do this. He'd been there for 70, more, 70 or so years, and every day, for uh, three times a day, for all those years, he went up and he went toward, he faced Jerusalem, and he prayed thanksgiving and prayers to God. Interesting to note, too, that Daniel knew, it says, when Daniel knew that it had been signed. He, he got the notification. He knew this was now law. And what did he do? What did he do? He prayed, exactly. He did not change his behavior one iota. King says, I can't pray. I'm going to pray. He went to his upper chamber, went to his window as he had every day for 70 or more years, and he got on his knees and he prayed. He didn't hide it, did he? He could have gone to a private place. He, he could have said, I know in you know, 500 years, Jesus is going to say, well, you want to pray, go to your closet and pray. So I'm going to go to my closet and pray. But he didn't. He went to his window and he prayed openly. Now, I want you to understand this, it wasn't just some act of passive aggressiveness like we in West Michigan are so prone to. I can be a little passive aggressive, I'll admit that. That's a con my, why are you nodding? <laughs> that would probably be the first amen I get from her this morning. <laughs> I know I can be a little passive aggressive, so I'm going to speak to this issue. We tend to be that way. And it's kind of like the government says, I can't pray. Well, and I'm going to make sure it knows I'm going to pray. Even if I never prayed before, I'm going to pray. Because why? Because they told me I couldn't. Saw a lot of that going on over the past two years, didn't we? People who never go to church were kind of concerned about they couldn't go to church at the time when the government shut it down. This was Daniel's custom every day of his life. And he just continued doing it. He didn't do it to defy them. He just didn't change, change his behavior. We saw as we went through the book with the boys, remember that's what we call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because that gets to be a lot of words to say. So we call them the boys. Well, with the boys, we saw that they were refusing to do something new that the government was telling them to do. You must bow before this idol. I'm not doing that. There's a time to stand, remember? Well, with Daniel, this time it is quite the opposite. We, refuse him, we see him refusing to stop doing something that the government said you cannot do now. But he had always been doing it before. This is a key to remember. As I said, we don't need to go around picking fights. We need to be consistent in our walk with the Lord. That's what we need to do. We just need to be true to our God and our faith in Him. If you're going to walk with God, when that time comes, if you plan on walking with God when the opposition comes, you better be walking with God today. That is the principle. He did not change his behavior because of what they did. He kept walking with the Lord, and so must we. And as he did, these men were watching. Verse 11 says, uh, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. What a surprise. They knew where and when he would be doing what. And they made a plan, and they set an appointment. They said, we know at 3 o'clock today he's going to be praying. All of you meet us up here. We're going to get selfies with Daniel praying in the background. We're going to catch him doing this, breaking this law. And as soon as they saw him there, verse 13, we see they squealed. They went running to Darius. And number one, once again, they lied. 
He said, he pays no attention to you. Was that true? No, and that is the same charge that they sent against the boys when they wouldn't bow. There's some of these Jews over here, and they're not paying any attention to you, Nebuchadnezzar. Same exact lie. In fact, same thing, they brought that same racial tone into it. They said again, uh, they went to King Darius and said, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah? This Jewish, this Jewish man over here. See the racism playing in again? And he's not paying any attention to you. This is bad for your government. You cannot have this foreigner defying you in the face of your nation. Or everything's going to fall apart. That's why this is the backdrop of the whole thing. And sadly, King Darius was trapped. He had to act on this new law because they, they were a government of law, like I said. He had to execute the order the same day by their laws. That's what it said. If, if, if it, he broke it that day, he has to face the penalty that day. And so he spent the whole day working with his lawyers, trying to figure out a way to get Daniel out of this. Now, his relationship with Daniel was more like Daniel's relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. They, they loved each other. But there was no legal way out. So he offered Daniel the one thing he could. In verse 16, he says, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. That's all I can give you, Daniel. I can't get you out of this. But I can say, I hope this God you've been trusting in is going to take care of you. You must understand this is really the pivotal point of the whole story. Much like the songs we sang this morning, this is a chance for God to shine in the greatest hour of darkness that his children face. That's what this is really all about. I've said it over and over again, this is not a story about us. We put ourselves in these stories. This is always a story about God and his power to save and his supremacy. And he is getting the opportunity to show this with us. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar asked the boys, who is the God that will deliver you from my hand? What was their answer? Our God. That's what the whole contest was. Bound by law, Darius executed the order. Verse 17, and a stone was brought and laid at the, on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. I believe it is no coincidence that this act bears such a resemblance to another man placed in a cave with a stone rolled over and a seal placed over the stone. Because our God is in the business of bringing life out of tombs. Darius spent the whole night pacing, worrying about Daniel, beating himself up because he let these men trick him into doing this. And he said, no entertainment, no food, anything. First thing in the morning, he ran to the den and he cried out, it says, in a tone of anguish, not hiding at all how he felt about Daniel. He didn't care who saw it. Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? This is the pivotal consideration of the entire chapter. And the answer was a resounding what? Yes. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. I mean, look at this lion up here. I've, I told Lisa, I'm going to miss him. I like him. Don't you just want to grab him and scruff him up and all and knock your glasses off and rub your head on his and wrestle with that lion some? Well, probably never get the chance in this life. Daniel might, you know, oh, here, kitty, 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 scratch his chin. You know, they didn't do any harm to him. Two things happened. Verse 24. And the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel... And they were brought and cast into the lion's den. Now, this is really harsh. Now, understand as I read this next part, this is not God declaring this. This was King Darius declaring this. They, their children, and their wives. Right? That was his choice. It's really harsh. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. They got their just desserts. I like dessert, not that kind. These were just desserts. And not that we would wish uh, this kind of treatment on anyone, but it did show us one thing. These lions were not weak and old lions. These guys never hit the ground before these lions tore them to pieces. They were powerful, they were strong, and they were hungry. They had just missed one meal and they weren't going to let another one go. It showed that God 
in his power held back these beasts and kept Daniel safe against all odds. It was a demonstration of his power. Verses 25 through 27, the other thing that happened, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, a worldwide proclamation, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. What a charge. For he, look at, listen to this, for he is a living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall never Never or shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. God again was glorified. Another pagan king in his empire came to see our God for who he truly is and how great and how superior he truly is. The eternal kingdom of Christ was proclaimed to the world. He says, for he is a living, king, a living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion uh, shall be to the end. That is just like the dream we saw in chapter 2 where the stone comes down and obliterates all the nations and the empires of the world and sets up the kingdom of Christ and it grows and fills the whole earth. That is the whole theme of the book of Daniel, and all the stories just go to show how true it is. Now, what does this all have to do with us? A couple points here, just wrapping up. Number one, we see over and over again, Daniel won over the very people who were his oppressors. You think about what that means. The very ones who were constantly, uh, the very ones who were his captives, these kings, these Babylonians, now these Medes and these Persians, Daniel won them over. That is the long game in living godly in a godless age. The people we see in the world who are the very people who are trying, uh, uh, they are the very people that we are trying to win over to Christ. and see saved by his grace and his power. The very ones we think are against us. We are not here to win a victory over them. We are here to win them over to Christ. And we can't do that by being combative all the time. We're not here to win, we're here to win them. That's the truth. God will win. We're here to bring them to him. Number two, every trial we face, this is what we keep in mind, is an opportunity for the power and the glory of God to shine through. That's how they will be won. We see that in every story that we've gone through in the book of Daniel. There is opposition and God shows himself superior to any opposition. And he is glorified. Remember that church I told you about at the beginning, the one I was a baby at that time, and it was burned down, and, and uh, I was talking to my mom yesterday, and I was going over the facts, because in case fact checkers look, and I want to make sure I'm correct and everything like that, so I'm asking her, and she's telling me this story, and she said one interesting thing at the very end of it, she said, it was all for the best. Isn't that odd? Why was it for the best? Well, that fire gave that church the opportunity to rebuild and do things over again and do things a little different. And the pastor's vision for what they could do to reach kid, the kids of that city, kind of city where the buses that were picking them up were shot at at times. And his vision was to reach out to that city. That fire gave them the ability to do that, to rebuild in a way that they could and reposition themselves and, and change their facility to the point where it had everything they needed to reach out to that community like that. Uh, he told me at one point I, he, he, would, he would tell his vision of what he wanted that church to be, and people would say he was crazy at that time. But it all came true, and it happened, and that church was able to reach kids from all over that city, bringing in hundreds of kids to hear about Christ in VBS and Awana and all these other ways of reaching out to them. It started with a fire. That is often how tragedy works when you're in the hands of God. No matter what, it will be worth it all. It may take some time. Maybe some pain, maybe some discomfort, but it will be all, worth it all. Whatever happens while we are living godly in a godless age, 
If we will hold true to him and live faithfully for him, he will hold us fast and his plans for his kingdom will unfold and it will be worth it all.